Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, before I begin, if there's any of you who at any point in this talk can't hear me, would you please just raise your hand and we will up the volume one way or the other? Last night I was uh, telling those of you who were here uh, the story of my encounter with a priest from Latin America. And I had said to him, it must be very difficult to be living you know, in a country that is such a colony of the United States. And he said to me, well, yes it is, but it's much easier than your situation. We at least know that we live in a colony. And we know that we have a different language and a different experience and so on. So our context, in a way, is far more open to a kind of contextual theology. So I'd like, I take that quite seriously as a remark that in our particular situation in Canada, living next to the elephant as we do, um, it is very difficult for us to name our own experience, to know here, to be able to speak from here and not from someplace else. And so today I, I want to talk somehow about how our literature and how our history as it has been written and our socioeconomic analysis, how in all these areas we have been struggling to name our Canadian experience and how that casts some light on some of the things that are going on in Canada in the present. And I see this process very much like what happened with the disciples along the road to Emmaus. Jesus did not come up to them and say, this is your experience, this is what it means, this is how it is a Christian experience, and this is how it isn't. They were simply walking along the road. And they were talking to one another about what had happened. And Jesus comes up beside them and doesn't really say all that much. But it's in their exchange and the discussion about what had happened that they begin to recognize Jesus in the midst of that. And I think that's what we are invited to do to exchange, to share with one another our understandings of what's happened here in this country and in our experience. And in trying to do this, I want to turn first to some examples from literature. As I mentioned last night, I have this secret life as a writer. So I tend to know a bit more about literature than I do about music or art or some other things. But I think that literature is so important. And increasingly in Canada, we're recognizing it as one of the most important activities that's going on in the country. And there is a theologian, Sally McFaig, who's recognized how important literature is in the development of theology, how important metaphor is. And she says, identifying and elucidating primary metaphors and models from contemporary experience. This is the task of theology, to express the Christian faith in our day in powerful and illuminating ways. So, very, very briefly this morning, I just wanted to pull out some of the metaphors from Canadian literature, which can enable us to at least, at least speak about the gospel in powerful and illuminating ways. Last night, I talked about the literary critic Northrop Fry, and he has I think provided us with some real insights into some of the 
metaphors and models which can be drawn out of Canadian literature. He notes, for example, that in Canadian literature, there is a very particular attitude towards nature. He says, we have all these stories about how the first explorers came to this country. And because there was this large, vast expanse of land, they felt dwarfed and diminished by the land. And so instead of the American experience in which the early explorers wanted to dominate the land, the first, not the first people here, the first people from Europe who came here felt dwarfed by this great land and their desire was not to exploit the land or to dominate, but simply to survive. And that is a, a fundamental difference, he says, between what it means to be American and what it means to be Canadian. He says, too, that in the face of the vast forces of nature, the weather, the snow, people drew together in little groups and protected one another in tiny little garrisons. And he says, in these garrisons, we developed a garrison mentality. We looked, we drew together, and we wanted to uh, live, he says, and this is in the Canadian Constitution, by law, order, and good government in the garrison. But we were fearful of everything and everyone outside of the garrison. And I think this insight is very instructive for us because so often in Canadian literature, and now even, it was the native peoples who were identified with these wild and uncivilized forces of nature that were so threatening to these little outposts of civilization. So we see a long thread in which the natives were somehow outside whatever we were about. Now, Margaret Atwood, another Canadian writer, has also analyzed our literature and pulled out and pulled forward this whole theme of survival. And she says that every culture is held together by a single unifying symbol. For example, in the United Kingdom, there is the recurring symbol of the island, a primary metaphor in that place. And in the United States, the symbol of the frontier is so essential, not just in their literature, but in the consciousness of the people. Now, last night I was talking about how most culture is really regional. But she's saying there is a way in which the experience of fighting to survive is true of all regions of the country. And she says, in the beginning, we were struggling to survive in a kind of minimal way against the weather, against the native people. And now we are talking about political survival. We are always a country that is barely just happening. And I think all of us who sat through the Meech Lake crisis last May, June, you know, we've experienced this sense of we are just barely surviving. She also says that throughout our literature, there are many images of the victim. You know, animals who have been trapped. And she sees this as central to the Canadian consciousness. She says, for many of us, we deny the fact that we are a victim. 
either economic victims, victims of our geography, of our history, or whatever. She says, or we may say, we are a victim, but we explain it away with some reason, like, oh well, this is because of the economics of the time, or this is God's will, or it's because of my family background. She says that the real challenge for us as Canadians is to admit that in many ways, politically and economically, we are victims, but to go beyond that and to begin to act creatively as non-victims. In other words, to refuse to be defined by the political and economic forces or ecclesial forces that keep us powerless. So I puzzle about this, and I think it's extremely important for us as Canadians, for us as Christians. There are so many ways that people in this country, and increasingly so, and we talked about this last night, people say, well, it won't make any difference anyway. Nothing I do counts anyway. That's the attitude of the victim. And that isn't just a personal problem. That is something that tends to be true because we are citizens of this country. Now, where we need to challenge ourselves and where the gospel challenges us, as we are talking about this and Jesus is walking along with us, we need to say, but is there a way in which we prefer it that way? Is there a way in which that we prefer to be victims? Then we don't have to be responsible. We don't have to shoulder the burden of guilt that may come from that. And so in strange ways, I think, Often, we choose to remain victims. We act in ways that are guaranteed to fail. We would rather not succeed because then we would have to be responsible. I mean, I think this is what temptation means in our context. I think this has been very powerfully stated by a Canadian writer, Joy Kogawa. She's a Japanese Canadian. And as a, as a young girl, she was in, in, interned in a camp during the Second World War. So she knows what it means to be a victim. And yet she says, I have to get beyond that. I have to realize there are ways in which, as long as I keep hanging on to that, I will never acknowledge that I may also be a victimizer. And so she said in a recent interview, it's so much easier, I've discovered, to be a victim than it is to be responsible for being a victimizer, that it's almost automatically chosen. And one looks for those ways in which one is a victim. It's almost that one feasts upon it to keep oneself alive as a victim. Because the other thing is too painful to bear and too difficult and so one shuns it. But it's self-defeating. One would want to choose the role of victim rather than to con concentrate on the responsibility one has when one is also a victimizer. I think she has a right to challenge us in this regard. And she has said, and so has Margaret Atwood said, that if we look at our literature and our experience, what we see in Canada is a profoundly ambivalent attitude towards authority. And I think this was so present during this whole Oka dispute this summer. On the one hand, because we are 
victims and because we tend to want to live in our own little garrisons. We are reluctant to undermine law, reluctant to disobey, and we are very nervous about anyone or any group that seems to disobey the law or rebel against authority. I think this is true in the church as well. And yet at the same time, while we're reluctant to do that, we tend to identify with the underdog, with the minorities and with the victims and those who are oppressed by the law and the system. So we have this profound ambivalence that shapes us as Canadians. And I think our first task is just to name that and to say, now how can that be transformed? What's good about that? What's promising and full of grace and what is potentially sinful? So Margaret Atwood and Fry, in examining Canadian literature, are talking about experiences which seem true of Canadians across the country. But there are other writers who write out of regional experiences. For example, if you look at literature from the prairies, there are so many scenes in which there is a single person against a vast horizon. That is a metaphor for so much of the prairie experience. Now, I don't pretend to know or to, I appreciate, but I'm not sure I fully understand all the literature that has been written out of the Maritimes. But I think it's extremely significant literature, and I think one of the best studies, recent studies, that's been done of it is by Janice Kulik Kiefer, called Under Eastern Eyes. And in this, she makes a very strong complaint against people in places like Toronto, who tend to dismiss maritime literature. And she says it's because so many people in the rest of Canada have what she calls the Laurentian view of the country, which means we identify with those early explorers who went down the St. Lawrence River and have proceeded to explore the country from there. Well, if you take that view of the country, you know, obviously the Maritimes off to the left are kind of forgotten, kind of not part of the whole vast process of nation building. And she says that's quite ignorant. Now when she looks at maritime literature, she says what is striking there is the sense of community and the struggle with community. And she says it's not the same thing as the garrison. Northrop Fry hasn't got it right if he just lays that over on us. And I just want to read what she says because I think it's, it's an important naming and it's also important theologically in terms of church, what it is that we struggle with, and in, in terms of political action. So she says, maritime literature tends to set down its heroes and heroines within isolated communities which cleave to land or sea, however unproductive or grudging they may be. The struggle is not against any lupine wilderness, but often against the limitations and towards the strengths of communal life itself. Maritime communities are not primarily defensive in nature, nor do they demand unswerving loyalty to a common code, qualities essential to garrison life. Rather, it is the power to nurture sustain and preserve meaningful experience, the positive, as well as to cramp, to choke off, or exclude new forms and expressions of being that makes of community an infinitely rich territory for maritime writers. So that is, that's what she has to say, and I think 
there's much to consider there when we're naming this experience. I think if we look to the literature of Quebec, what is interesting there is the various images of the rest of Canada. Sometimes and very often, English Canada is presented as the colonizer, the French as the colonized. At other points and in other places, we see a relationship of what some have called the Siamese twin relationship. We're bound together. We'll die if we're cut off. And yet, it's an awkward coexistence. And then I think more recently, some would say that the relationship is simply that of two people with their backs to each other. We know we're there. We know each other is there, but we are facing in different directions. So those are some of the ways, I think, in which our literature helps us name our experience, not just in the past, but in the present as well. So let me turn now to the work of Canadian historians, again, very briefly. These are the ones who tell us stories. And they tell us stories in different ways about our experience. Some will say that our story is primarily influenced by political forces that we are the way we are because we have been a colony of England. Or we are the way we are because we have, were the people who rejected the American Revolution and all that it stood for. Or we are the way we are because we are a conflict of two histories, French and English. Those are political forces. Others will say, that our story is more shaped by the environment, by the land. We are shaped by the frontier. The West is the place of excitement, and the East is the stodgy old conservative place. Or they will say, we, our story is the way it is because our country is primarily driven by three large metropolitan centers. And around these centers, in the hinterland, is the rest of the country. So we can read our history as that of the conflict between the metropolis and the hinterland. Or we can look at our whole country as the hinterland for a large metropolis, New York or some place in Europe. Now, those are some of the various theories of Canadian history, and I'm summarizing them briefly. What I find interesting is that in so many of our textbooks, until recently, there were so many chapters of our history that were left out. So we get all these books about Canadian history. And the best one could say about them is that they were very boring. It looked so tolerant, so nice, and so innocent. And I think it's only recently that we are becoming aware that there are some very dark chapters in our history. For example, the expulsion of the Canadians. That is not new to you, uh, the Acadians. That's not a new chapter to you. Lots of people in the rest of Canada don't know about it. They really don't. For example, the chapter about Louis Riel, the way in which the Japanese Canadians had all their rights and property stripped from them in the Second World War, the way in which our country had the worst record in the Western world during the Second World War, regarding Jewish refugees. We let in less than any country in the world. The October crisis, the suspension of civil rights, the suspension of civil rights of the Communist Party, of the Jehovah Witnesses in Quebec. There are many dark chapters 
And we prefer to think of ourselves as innocent and as tolerant. And I am very convinced that that is very dangerous. To the extent that we do not know the evil we are capable of as, as Canadians, we do not know the good that we can do. To be innocent is to remain with a sense of powerlessness that does not enable us to act effectively in history. I think it's very dangerous. And let me just give you one personal example. Some years ago, I was an innocent about these things. And when the Vietnam War was on, I protested and protested and protested about what was going on at the American Embassy all the time down on University Avenue. I thought it was just terrible what the Americans were doing. And I thought the use of napalm was terrible. Now I discovered this year, and this was written up in the Globe and Mail, that napalm was manufactured not in the States, but in a little town of Alora, Ontario, by a Canadian company. Alora is a lovely little tourist town. People go there for the fall fairs. It's a postcard place. And that's where the napalm was being manufactured. That's what I mean. We need to name our own history. And in doing so, I think, can name the good that we are able to do. Now, there are some writers who will say, we don't really have a history. Uh, we don't have a larger story as a nation. We just have little stories. As I said last night, short stories. We have bits and pieces. And so somebody like the Edmonton writer Robert um, Kretsch would say, instead of talking about history, we should talk about archaeology. That what we're really doing is we're kind of looking for the little bits and pieces from the past and trying to put it together somehow to figure out what really happened. And so he says, and I just love this line, he says, you know, we don't really have a history. We just keep track. We keep track of things. And so one of his best poems is called The Seed Catalog. And he uses, he notes the way in which many people tend to say the Eaton's catalogs or all these different catalogs because it's our way of keeping track of what we had and what we know. And so that's is an interesting way of looking at things, that we just have these little bits and pieces and stories from the past. But in terms of the bigger story or a unified story, we'd say, no, there is no such thing. Now, as I mentioned last night, when our sense of history as a nation tends to be fragmented, it is not a strong narrative with a dramatic beginning, a middle, and a kind of goal and purpose that is dramatically stated. When that is true, people tend to look more to geography and to the land for a sense of meaning and purpose, like the ocean, like the sky, like certain rivers and lakes, the sense of God, the sense of oneself and identity comes from those encounters with land. And one writer, Ortega y Gasset, has often said, tell me the landscape <clears throat> in which you live and I will tell you who you are. What difference does it make that you live in a place where you can look out and see the ocean? I never saw the ocean till I was 21. I think that makes a difference. Uh, Lawrence Durrell, the English writer, has said, the important determinant of any culture is, after all, the spirit of place. What is it that you know about yourself as a Christian? 
as a Canadian because you're here. Heidegger tells us it's important for us to have a place to dwell, to know where it is that we dwell, our place on the earth. Now Robertson Davies, the Canadian writer, says that there is something just about the sheer expanse of Canada, just the distance and the space that is so extraordinary that has shaped within us an almost mystical sense that there is deep within the Canadian psyche, and people can dispute this, but this is what he says, a, a kind of sense of God or spirit that has just been shaped by the vastness of space. And he says that often contradicts with other experiences we have. And he says, I love this, I see Canada as a country torn between a very northern, rather extraordinary mystical spirit which it fears and its desire to present itself to the world as a Scotch banker. Responsible, careful, all moderate, tolerant, Scotch banker. Those are some, I'm moving very quickly here, but just some considerations about, from our history, that can help us maybe live now in a more real way. There has been a lot of work done, and I move here to the whole area of economic analysis and social analysis. There's been a lot of work done on that in Canada. And I think many of the attempts to articulate a Canadian theology have based their reflections primarily on the economic structure of Canada. Um, the, many of these people, for example, see us definitely as an economic colony, that we are economically dependent on the United States. And they point out again and again our constant experience of thinking we are independent. We have a different political structure, but at the same time experiencing our dependence. And I think that was what the free trade debate was about, trying to weigh those two realities, political independence and economic dependence. Now, while that there is a way in which our economic system as a colony is true of the whole country, it does get very regionalized, and region exerts a modifying reality, and I think you know that in the Maritimes, regional disparity. So while we are all an economic colony of the United States, there are colonies within colonies. It's not clear in Canada whether there is any one dominant form of oppression. There is a regional oppression there is oppression because of race. There is oppression because of gender. There is oppression which takes place for all people in the whole bureaucratic system. And Gregory Baum has written extensively on this, that while there are some places in the world where we can say, you know, this is the source of oppression, we can't say in our country that it's just economic oppression. There are many, many factors that go into people's experience of oppression. What we do know, I think, from our economic analysis is that there are those in this country who experience themselves as powerful, as having some power. Now that may be because of money, but it may also be, and this is increasingly true in an information-based society, because they have information. Information is power. 
the ability to use information or to influence information is powerful. And I think we know that there are those in our country who for whatever reason feel powerless. But, and this is the point I want to make, this feeling of powerlessness is not exactly the same as the feeling of powerlessness experienced by people, for example, in El Salvador. There is a way in which even the very poor in El Salvador have an experience of a community, of either a family or a base community. They have a rich local culture. Religion is still, by and large, a meaningful point of identity for them. I think in our culture, the experience of poverty, of powerlessness, is very often a resented experience. People can be very poor, but have a TV, and day after day be exposed to the lifestyles of the rich and famous. It breeds resentment. And it also breeds tremendous illusion that that is really the goal, lifestyles of the rich and famous. And so if we look at this, that there are the powerful and there are the powerless in this country, we would have to say, um, what is the location? What is the locus of theology? Where do we begin to think from about this situation as Christians? You know, where we live determines what we see. And who we listen to determines what we hear. Do we listen to those who are poor, powerless, or do we listen to the powerful? This question has often been stated by others. Now what I would simply add is in the first place, it's very dangerous, I think, for us to begin to theologize by saying, we are with the poor and the powerless. For this reason, for this reason, let me explain. That if we say about a person, you are poor or you are powerless, that is already a disempowering statement. It's like what I was talking about, the victim thing. If I say to somebody, you are a victim, that is a disempowering situation, even if I mean very well even if I want to be liberating in the process and to be in solidarity with that person, the language is disempowering. And so I think the first thing we need to do if we are naming our experience and, and thinking about it theologically is to say, these are people who are economically poor. In other words, being economically poor is not their whole identity. They are people. Or these are people who are victimized in this particular situation. But being victim isn't the whole truth about them. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a very important thing and a kind of thing that goes on all too often in academia. We talk about people in categories of concern rather than saying these are people who have dignity, who have capacity, who also have this particular problem. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing I would say is that I'm not sure that in the very long run it is going to be helpful for us to say that we need to do theology only from the side of the poor. 
in because of this that if we say we look at our economic system we see that there is a huge problem not just with this or that or this or that but the whole system is based on injustice if we say we must think about that only because it affects this group of people only because it affects those who have below this amount of money or only because it affects the native people if we do that then in the very long run we're not going to change things drastically because we're saying the only thing wrong with this system is that it just isn't working for these people and i think it's more true to say that it's these people who are showing us that there is something wrong with our economic system not just for them but for everybody and i think for us to do theology in the canadian context is to listen to the voices on the margins of the country listen to what they're saying like the native people at oka because they are the ones who are most sharply experiencing what is true for all of us and that's what we need to do is first listen to where the voices are crying out and then say and in what way is what they're saying true for all of us and i do think that much of what they're saying is true for all of us that the system our economic system in many ways our political system it just isn't working and it is dehumanizing people and i'll be talking more about that this afternoon about how we live not just in a canadian culture or a regional culture we live in a culture shaped by the values of materialism and in that we are all being dispirited the natives are losing their native spirituality but all of us are losing our spirits in this culture and just as an aside there i wanted to mention i i have this woman who's a native friend and i was telling her i was so thrilled that uh, you know there were so many courses on native culture being offered now and so on and she said yeah but um we know we will have really arrived when they begin to offer courses on white culture <laughs> when we begin to realize that we have to take our culture seriously so i think our our economic system invites us to reflect on power and i would say that we have people a large group of people in this country who have an ambivalent experience of power they don't feel totally powerful but they don't feel totally powerless either and i think this is the middle class they sometimes they feel powerful like they can change their lives they can direct their lives that they can do something and at other times they feel totally powerless like the taxes like the gst mortgages all the economic realities of the country and i think for us as people in the church and as canadians the fact that we have such a large middle class is extremely significant. We can't simply take a theology developed in Latin America where there are the such extremes 
where the vast majority of people are poor and a few are rich. We can't take that social analysis and just flip it out here easily when we have such a large middle class. Now somebody here last night, and I wish she was here because we, we could have a wonderful discussion, said, I've just given up on the middle class. Forget it. After the free trade debate, she said, they're just going to sell out every time. I mean, she was, she's, was quite clear on her feelings on this. Now I said to her afterwards, and we can discuss this, um, you know, I think it's important for us not to give up hope on the possibility that people of the middle class may see that what the economically poor are suffering, that we are all suffering from the same system. And the more and more people of the middle class feel economically stretched, feel economically victimized by all the various policies that are going on, there is the possibility of social change if people in the middle class can see that they will not uh, find their way in life by forgetting about it. Now, when one does a lot of uh, social analysis in this country, one finds oneself getting extremely suspicious. In other words, you begin to ask questions like, who's really running things? You know, in whose interest is this? And you begin, and as people said last night, you get very suspicious of politicians. You know, we heard all this beautiful talk at the discussions about Meech Lake in June, about nation building and compromise as the great Canadian virtue. And then we read that the Prime Minister was rolling the dice, that it was all a setup in the first place, and that he was using the language of compromise to get people to go his way. So you become very suspicious and you begin to ask questions and you can begin to see how our economy is so driven by the needs and the wants of the United States and will be increasingly so. And the really important question I think for us as Christians is we may know these things but why is it that we feel so reluctant to do anything about it? That's a question of faith. We may know but why is there such a gap between what we know and our action? Now I think some of it is this thing of that we feel victims and I think where we as Christians have something very important to bring in this country is that we can say on the basis of our faith, you are not just a victim. You are of God. You are a son, a daughter, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father of God. That's who you really are. So we have much to say in this context, I think. Another reason, I think, it, that we fail to act is that we lie to ourselves. We tell what Christopher Lash has called the vital lie. We know something, but we lie to ourselves. We say, but it's not really true. And we lie to ourselves because we are terrified that we might have to change our identity if we told the truth. If we told the truth and said, there 
is something very wrong with our economic and political system. And we are citizens of this country. If we started to tell the truth and to tell it to one another, it is just possible that we might then have to take responsibility, that we might have to act politically. But we are kept from acting because of our own desire, often, I'm thinking this is, this is not a personal problem, this is us as Canadians. We want to remain victims. And the dominant ideological forces of this country want us to remain that way. So we are fed a daily dose of consumer advertising that we really should want to live the lifestyles of the rich and famous. And that if we don't, it's because we haven't been loyal or we haven't worked hard enough. Then it's our personal problem. So these are some of the reasons, I think, why in the face of the truth of our economic reality, we remain politically inactive. But the most important reason I think is that right now as a country we lack an alternative vision an alternative vision socially humanly and I think what most people are almost despairing of now is that they hardly see any alternatives in the political parties there is a tremendous cynicism about politicians, about political parties. And I think this is where we as Christians, as people with a biblical vision, I mean, we do have a vision, an alternative vision of what it means to be human what it means to live together as people sharing a culture, an economy, politics. We have a vision of what the reign of God, the basics of that are. We don't have the particular. But this is a time, I think, in this country for us to speak about vision. Now, as I said yesterday, there are ways in which very few, increasingly, are looking to the mainline churches for vision. But remember that the church is all of us. It's us here. Small community, people. We have vision to bring. And this afternoon, I'd, I'd like to say more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Uh, Sister Mary Jo is willing to entertain questions or comments. Um, there are two microphones in the aisles. If you uh, think you can't make yourself heard for everybody, would you please use them? And uh, All right, I realize that some of you had a class about five minutes ago. Yes? Uh, my name is Barbara Remscheid. I was at a meeting recently of the Canadian Council of Churches and it took place in Quebec not too far distant from the events at Oka and as you can imagine there was a lot of discussion and concern and anguish about those circumstances on the occasion of that meeting we were welcoming into the Canadian Council a small Ukrainian uh, denomination from Manitoba 
and that was also being celebrated in a different part of the meeting. Mm -hmm. That had already happened when these discussions began about OCA. And as this discussion went on and the sense was given that this was something new and urgent and something that was sort of new to, can to Canadian experience, the young Ukrainian priest who was there on behalf of that denomination said with a certain amount of exasperation, I really resent the implication that this is something new, particularly the uh, violence being attributed to the uh, Sirte Quebec. And he said, if you came out to my community in Manitoba, I could take you to a graveyard where you'd see lined up tombstones of young men that say, killed by the RCMP. Yeah. And these were young men killed in labor violence yeah. uh, and strike action. Uh, the, what I would like to ask you is about uh, how much experience you have, and this is a huge question to ask in a context like this, but Why in the not? literature <laughs> of uh, narratives of struggle, and the stories of experiences of struggle in Canada. I know they're, they're very buried. <laughs> the reasons you gave when you explained about the history books, they're hard to find. They've only e recently been unearthed, much of the labor history and women's history. But I'm wondering to what extent you would see any hope in those narratives, those kind of minority narratives, as providing resources to us to get out of our, our yearning for innocence um, or do you think that they're also tainted by the same Canadian characteristics that you've outlined? Is there anything about the Canadian experience of struggle in small communities across Canada that overrides that larger sense and can be a resource to us uh, that we can turn to, particularly groups that we would be tempted to call victims, but to look to them as sources of salvation for our paralysis. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent question. Thank you. And I, I'm not sure I can do justice to it. I, I am somewhat aware of the tremendous effort on the part of many groups to recover their history. Um, I'm part of a little effort to set up a, um, a couple of schools of native writers across the country and their work will be to listen to the oral tradition, the oral stories, and then to kind of translate those into, well, we'll see what's going to happen. Uh, I think the deep question you're asking is, in writing those histories, um, what happens? Does it just increase the sense of victimization you know, on the part of people? And I think what Margaret Atwood is saying that the very first step to liberation is, first of all, you've got to name the victim experience. That there has been, on the part of several groups in this country, an experience of victimization that is not just unreal. It is real and needs to be named as such. Her point is simply, we can't stop there, any of us. I mean, it's one thing for us to say, we have experienced this as oppression. But then she says, we need to become creative non-victims, which means we will not let ourselves be defined by that history. We will not deny it, but we will not be defined by it. And that's very true, for example, in terms of, say, women in the church. We do not deny what is happening or happening but we will not be defined by that. And we do not want, and this is where real liberation comes in, we don't want to repeat ourselves those patterns over others. You know, so that's part of the question. And I think what Joy Kogawa is saying is it's very important for us to write the history, these histories. And she's, she did it in her novel, Obasan. But she said, it must not blind me to the truth that in some ways, yes, I have experienced being a victim because I'm Japanese. But in other ways, I could be a victimizer because I do live in a first world country. I do participate in this economy. So I am both, and I can't let one experience blind me to the, to the other. And I'd say the flip side may also be true that, you know, some guilty white liberals 
see themselves mostly as victimizers. And maybe their challenge is to realize, you know, in what way are they also victims of a system? And so on. Um, I think the, the further question will be for us, you know, the, the, the listening to one another's stories of many groups. And in the, the um, interview that I read to you from Joy Kogawa, she says something really important. She says um, about all the various minority groups in the country, um, One of the problems we have is the competing voices of the victims, like the Ukrainians, the natives, the French, whatever. Whether we're women or whoever we are, the various minority groups, we become competitors for center stage. This tends to nullify a lot of the change we could bring about if we could identify with and assist each other. So telling our story should not prevent us from hearing the others. As I proceed through political endeavor, I've been seeing that change does not come about when one remains solely in the role of the victim. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Do you, would you want to ask another question? Because it's, it's very important. Good, I got your question. So, I mean, one thing is to tell the story, but there are also stories of liberation and resistance. And to use the, the Ukrainians, I'm certainly aware out West, their, their resistance wasn't just resistance to arrest. It was a cultural resistance. I mean, they built these gorgeous little churches in the middle of nowhere on the prairies. And I used to have a girlfriend whose father was an icon painter. And he used to go around to all these little places on the prairie, painting these ceilings of these churches. I mean, this, that was resistance, to build something beautiful in the place of exile, their place of exile. They built this gorgeous place. So I totally agree, and um, I know at New Times, we, Catholic New Times, we work very hard at this, trying to tell the good news story of where people admitted their oppression and then together came to a sense of power and change. I mean, that's enabling and those are very empowering stories. Any other questions? I'll repeat your question, Betty. know why um, you are stressing the stories and the literature, but I just wanted to uh, refer at least to the power of other types of media, especially art and music. Mm -hmm. And I recall um, the exhibit we had here that was uh, formed here last fall, uh, the Africville exhibit, uh, recording in, not in literature, but in very striking memorabilia and, and um, pictures, the uh, suffering of that community which had been displaced. And it has taken a good while, and I think it always seems to take a certain amount of time before people can admit um, and expose their feeling of victimization. But that has now gone across the country, 
and there is a movement among those people now to try to buy back that land, which is now a park, uh, because it's part of their identity. Uh, so I think we also have to be aware of uh, folk music and uh, mm -hmm. some of that, which also records some of these experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I couldn't agree more. That the whole study of folklore, I think, is so interesting. And it's a woman from the Maritime, who's Maritimes, who has really spearheaded that. She's dead now, and I can't remember her name. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, her book on folklore is wonderful, and I think uh, just so interesting and, and such an important area of study. I basically, I'm just claiming my ignorance of certain areas, but I. I think when we're talking about Canadian experience, that's where we have to to share, you know, the, the, the what we know, the ways in which we know it, because none of us can do it by ourselves. Thank you. Question. See some hands tentatively coming up. Thank you, Sister Mary Jo, for a very enlightening analysis. Um, I want to remind you that uh, the lectures continue this afternoon at 2 o'clock in the same place. And the lecture this afternoon is entitled, The Mission of the Church in a Dispirited Society. Thank you, and we hope to see you back this afternoon. <laughs>